Our Heavenly Father, I want to say thank you once again this evening for you have been so gracious unto us to allow us to gather. And uh, these are the sessions that uh, you have promised you will outpour thy Holy Spirit upon all flesh. And so, Lord, as this little company gathers here to praise your name and to listen to you speak to their hearts, Lord, may you diminish the glory of men and put it in dust that only Christ may be seen and the light of heaven may shine upon the hearts of thy people. We pray that uh, your will may be done on earth as it is in heaven. And Lord, as we learn these things, that they may prepare us for the coming events. And not only that, but to equip us with the skills and the necessary knowledge to be the ministers in thy vineyard in these end times. As we see the earth full of darkness, Lord, how we desire that we may be a light shining in dark place until the day dawn when the Son of Man shall be revealed in the clouds of the air. And so in this little sharing, Father, we pray that your presence may be with us, dispel the presence of the dark angels, and let your holy angels be in this place to guard the minds and to work through these feeble instruments and help us to comprehend the message of the hour. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Yeah, we are having a lost child here. So we have a lost and found child. So let us uh um do my is not working. Uh, in this camp meeting, as I say, we are going through the book of Revelation chapter 18, one to four, and uh, it will be good if uh, we read what the verses say as uh, we acquaint ourselves with uh, what uh, the Lord would want us to go through through this week in the book of uh, Revelation chapter 18. Uh, in Revelation chapter 18, verses 1 by 5 by 7, that are done. Um, and after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having what? Great power and the earth was done what? The earth was lightened with his glory. Now, this angel did not just have a great light, but also with that great power, he cried mightily with what? A strong voice saying, what? Babylon the great is done what? Is fallen is fallen and is become the habitation of devils and the whole of every foul spirit and a cage of what? Every unclean and hateful bird, verse 3, for all nations have done what? Drunk of the wine of the wrath of a fornication and the kings of the earth 
have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacy. Verse 4, and I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not all a place. And so this is the message that the Lord has given us that we may proclaim even at this hour as we see the signs foretold in the Bible happening before our eyes. That when you look around, you see a world full of darkness in correspondence with the greatness of the darkness is a message that has power that has to fill the whole world with the glory of God. At this time, let us look at the time setting of the message being given, the time setting of the message being given in uh, In the book of Isaiah, chapter 60, the book of Isaiah, chapter 60, let us look at the time setting of the message of Revelation, chapter 18. For we are told that um, I saw another angel coming from heaven with great power, is it? And the whole world was filled with the glory. Now, I want you to look at the time setting, the, the corresponding time of the earth being filled with the glory of God. And, uh, and that uh, message coming with power. In Isaiah 16, uh, verse 1 says what? Arise, shine for thy light is done. Is come and the glory of the Lord is risen. Upon this, so you have to understand some things that uh, the angel is coming down with power and the glory of God lighten up the whole world. And in Isaiah, that is where we are being told this is the time to arise and shine for the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. So we understand that uh, at that time when the angel comes down with power and the glory. It is a time for the church of God to arise and do what? And shine. For the glory of God has risen upon thee. And as we have studied that the glory of God is his character, revealed in his character. Now look at verse 2. For behold what? Behold. The darkness shall cover the earth and gross darkness the people, but the Lord shall arise upon thee and his glory shall be done more. Seen upon thee. And what? And the Gentiles shall come to thy light and the kings to the brightness of thy what? Of thy rising. So this is a rising message and what makes it arise is the power of God accompanying it. Now, as the message goes, hither and thither, the Gentiles and the kings of the earth will come to the brightness of thy rising. We have never seen such an event taking place. The only time we saw kings coming to the brightness of the rising of the people of God was in the time of the Reformation with the people like John Wickley, uh, Huss, Jerome, Tyndale, and the other uh, 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 reformers, and it was during the time of the Dark Ages. Now, if you look at the parallels of events, is that uh, during that of time of Reformation, when the king came to the light and the Gentiles came to the light, it was the rise of the powers when she was coming to rulership, when she was ascending to her throne. Back in the years of 538 AD to 1795, during that time period, when the papacy was rising, 
there was also a reformation that brought the Gentiles and the king to the rising of the glory that was on the people of God. And so, there is nothing new under the sun. What has been is what shall be, and the Lord required of the history of the past, is it? It came a time when that reformation seemed like it was dead, but at the same time, we have the purpose receiving the mortal wound. And so we understand from the history that God required from when the purpose starts rising again to bring darkness upon the world, then we can expect reformation again rising. Is that a fair judgment? So when we see the purpose arising, we can be sure that the Lord wants to outpour his spirit upon the people of God so that they may rise and shine in proportion to the darkness that will be in the world, so shall be the light that the Lord will give to his people. One thing that we have to ask ourselves, will we participate in the darkness or the light that shall arise at that time? It is something that everyone has to make a decision. Now, the decision is simple and it is hard according to the way or the relationship you have with your Lord. For when we read the Bible, when we turn to Philippians chapter 1, and it verse 6, what does it say? Being what? Being confident of this very thing that he which had begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of what? Of Jesus Christ. So we can expect that if you make the decision for Christ, it is the one who has started the work in you and he shall accomplish it. It is not you who is going to struggle with this journey. Philippians 4, 13 says, I can do all things through who? Christ, who strengthens me. And so we can be sure, we can be sure that uh, he who is in us is better than the one who is in the world, and he can accomplish that which he has started in us. And uh, we are told, arise and shine. Now, normally when we talk about arise and shine, let us look at the book of Matthew chapter 14. The book of Matthew chapter, chapter 5, sorry, verses 14 down. We are told arise and do what? Rise and shine. And what is this rising and shining in proportion or arising to the power that that angel brings? In uh, Matthew chapter 5 from verse 14, we read, ye are what? The light of a city that is set on an hill cannot be done what? Cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under what? A bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the world, in the house. So let your light so shine before whom? Men, that they may see what? Your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. And so when the angel comes down with power and glory, what it is expecting is the character of God to be seen in his people and that they may enter into these reformations with the power of God and let their light shine so that people may give glory to the Father. When this message is announced, it is the last message before the second coming of Jesus Christ because you see in Revelation chapter 18, a sequence of events happening. Then in Revelation chapter 19, what do you see? A bride made ready for what? For the bridegroom, is it? 
clothed in linen, is it? And that linen we are told it is the righteousness of the what? Of Christ and the righteousness of the saints. So this is the issue. In Revelation chapter 18, we are seeing that the angel is coming down with power and glory. In Revelation chapter 19, which follows, you see that the church is clothed with the righteousness of Christ. And then immediately after that, you see Jesus Christ having a garment written on what? The King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And behind him are what? The armies of heaven marching for what? For a war. We understand that right now Christ is in the heavenly sanctuary and on his vesture is written the Lord our righteousness. He has that um, uh, 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 that cape or uh, the mitre of uh, the high priest. Right now, Jesus Christ does not have the mitre of king of kings and lord of lords, is it? He's having the mitre of what? The high priest, meaning what? Intercession is still going on, is it? And you have to remedy every defect in your character by his power and be able to enter in the marriage of the Lamb with him. For when he comes out, he removes the mitre of intercession and he puts on the garments of virgins, where he has to tread the wine press, which is mixed, which is poured out without mixture. And we know without that mixture, is there is no mixture of mercy because probation has closed. And so arise and shine. Let your light shine that the people may give glory to the Father. Let us go back to Revelation chapter 18. Revelation chapter 18. There is one thing also you have to notice in Revelation chapter 18. As we just start these introductory messages and welcome you to the... 2023 come meeting. And so in Revelation chapter 18, the message has a twofold uh, sequence. The message has a, a twofold uh, uh, chronology. First of all, in Revelation chapter 18, verse 1, you see that the earth is lightened up with the glory of God. So the message doesn't start with the proclamation. One thing that uh, really we have messed up with is the proclamation of the message not accompanied with the revelation of the message. The first thing you meet in Revelation chapter 18 is the revelation of the message. And... Uh, you understand that Revelation 18 is the repetition of the second and the third angel's message, is it? And so the revelation of the message is the first one before the proclamation of the message. What is the difference between the revelation and the proclamation? This is the revelation. Uh, in Revelation chapter 14, before the three angels' messages starts to be proclaimed, what do you see in Revelation chapter 14? The 144 standing on Mount Zion with the Lamb and having what? The Father's name in their forehead. After you see them on Mount Zion, then that is when you see the three angels' messages, is it? The people have to be prepared first so that the message they will proclaim matches their life. And so they have to stand on Mount Zion with the Lamb. And why is with the Lamb? Because they are standing with the efficacious power of Jesus Christ. They are ready to proclaim what has been manifested in their lives. Amen? Are we together? That the people can only proclaim what has been done what? Manifested. The revelation is the manifestation of the message itself. And so, they have, and before you reach to the first angel's message, which is 
I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having what? An everlasting what? Gospel. Before that, in verse 7, you find in verse 5 that these 144, they follow the Lamb whatsoever he goes. The Lamb doesn't go to a certain place and the people remain at another place. Are we together? So the people are going to proclaim the three angels' messages. They have to be where the Lamb is. Are we together? And so the people who are in the courtyard, can they be able to proclaim the message? Can you proclaim it in the holy place? You have to be where? And what does it mean to be the most holy place? We are told that um, uh, they reflect Christ as he is. Are we together? That uh, in the most holy place is uh, a place for blotting out of sin. Are we together? The most holy place is not a place per se for receiving sin. As we look at these messages, we shall see. It is a place for doing what? Blotting out of sin. In that the sins of the people go before her so that they may be blotted out of the sanctuary. Sometimes we think that as Christ enters into the most holy place, he still continues with this daily ministration. But there's some points which actually we are wrong on that. God helping us, we, we can learn about that. And so the first thing is the manifestation of the message in Revelation chapter 18. After the people manifest the message, then in verse 2 you hear, and he cried mightily with a strong voice saying what? Babylon is done what? Is fallen. Now, there's another thing that we do. We tell people, do what? Come out of Babylon, is it? Without showing the people that Babylon is fallen. There is the manifestation of the message in you and me that we may reveal the character of God. Then there is the practical aspect of showing that Babylon is fallen, is it? Now, what does it mean Babylon is fallen? Let us try to see when it says Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen. And why has it fallen and become a habitation of devils and whole of every foul spirit and a cage of unclean and hateful bird? Because she made for all nations have drunk the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Now, let us try to just narrow down this. How do you proclaim that uh, Babylon is fallen? And uh, we talk about these reformations. Babylon is fallen, is it? It is financial system is falling, is it? Is Babylonian financial system falling? Or we think it is still the best for us? Is her educational lines falling? Is it falling? Is the educational system of Babylon falling? Can you truly show that it's falling? Because we are looking at the manifestation of the message, the proving that it is fallen, and then you can really go and tell people, come out of how my people is it. So if you can prove that the financial system of Babylon is fallen, her educational lines is fallen, her doctrines are fallen, and her health system is fallen, then you are ready to call the people out of Babylon. For you are not allowed to call people out of Babylon when they are coming in Babylon. Is it so? So we must prove to the world. We must manifest. And so the question that we should ask ourselves that are we ready for the proclamation of this message? 
We shall never be ready if we don't follow the Lamb whatsoever he goeth and we have manifested in our lives. So how do we prove that uh, she's fallen? How are, do, how are you people doing financial? Great or bad? Huh? No, th th these are not things that we have to talk about, is it? How are doing? How how are you doing financial? Let us talk. Why? Hard economic times. The question is asked always: Should an Adventist be crying of hard economic times? What happened that at the, at this time they shall be living like kings and queens? Why are we not living like kings and queens in such a time as this? Because we are in a system which has failed us and we can't come out of it, is it? How are we doing health-wise? Good or bad? Are we struggling? Are we, are we struggling health-wise? Why? We are still stuck in the health system of Babylon, is it? That is why we are struggling. But these are the things we have to look into. Before we announce Babylon is fallen, you cannot announce something is fallen when you are inside. Now, let us take an example. If this house is fallen down, how can you pronounce it is fallen when you are inside? Is it possible to say that this building is fallen? When you are inside, is it possible? I presume you will be dead, is it? If this building collapses, for adventure you get out alive, but uh, if it collapses and uh, God forbid we die, can we pronounce that this building is fallen? So th these are simple practical lessons that we cannot go outside to say Babylon is fallen when actually we are in the same system that is fallen, is it? Yeah, so we have to study about Babylon and see that uh, it is fallen. For all nations have drunk of the wine of her wrath of fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are wax rich through the abundance of her delicacies. You see also even the businessmen are really into this thing. They are in Babylon. And so if this is where all businessmen are, you have to ask yourself, how are you doing in commerce? How are you doing business-wise? Are you in Babylon or are you out of Babylon? And then you can announce that that system of Babylon and it is merchants and businesses fall and come out of her. But if you are still operating on it is plain, then you cannot announce that it's fallen. You have to come out of first so that you may announce that. And so Babylon is fallen, is fallen, is a message that we have to study because she made uh, the earth drink the wine. She made the all earth drink the wine of her fornication. And uh, we understand wine in a literal sense has to do with food. And in a spiritual sense, it has to do with the teachings. Now we think it is only the teachings of the Bible. That is, we are talking about doctrinal aspects of Babylon in Revelation chapter 18. But it doesn't just stop there on doctrinal issues. It goes beyond doctrinal issues. When you say that the world has drunk the wine of her fornication, it doesn't just start and end at the doctrines, but it goes beyond the doctrines. The everything, for we are told that uh, anything any system, any institution operated not based on the word of God, it is fallen. Whether it be a theological school, whether it be a secular school, whether it be any trade, then we can categorize it with Babylon. If it is not operated on the standard of the word of God, that institution is fallen, and then you must come out. In a Christian service, I just want you to see in a Christian service, because we are talking about Babylon fallen, 
as we are talking about Babylon fallen, uh, there's something that um, we find in Christian service. Look at this on the day of atonement. We have to understand that uh, in the proclamation of uh, the manifestation, the proving, and uh, the proclamation of Babylon is fallen, it is in the timeline of the great day of atonement when it's coming to an end. It is not the beginning of the atonement, but it is the end of atonement. And so the people of God have to be gathered around the sanctuary. In the typical service on the day of atonement, all Israel left everything they were doing and they were gathered around the sanctuary. Reason being that they didn't have to be distracted by anything else that could not help them hear the voice of the high priest in the, in the most holy place. And so in a Christian service, page 108, paragraph 3, we are told if any are engaged in what? In business. Can we be able to see the screen? Or should I increase the size? We are able to see. The words in yellow, if any are engaged in what? Where they cannot, in divine life and perfect what? In the fear of who? They should do what? Change to a business in which they can have Jesus with them every, every hour. And so you ask yourself, as you are planning to tell people to come out of Babylon and show them that it is fallen, how, what is your life anchored unto? What has preoccupied your life? And this is what we call the job reformation on the day of atonement, a job reformation on the day of atonement. You cannot afford to live in the day of atonement and miss Jesus Christ an hour. For the people who are proclaiming this message, they are seen with the lamb on Mount Zion. They follow the lamb whatsoever he goeth, and they are where he is, and they cannot afford to be with him, be, to be without him every hour of their lives. And so the very things that people are preoccupied with in such a day of atonement, it has to be shown to them that it is not going to perfect their character. For in the day of atonement, no one was to do any survival work, a work that was not connected to the atonement. And yet we are told up here, it is not about saying that those who are mechanics should stop being mechanics, those who are carpenters should stop being carpenters. But there's a principle that in every line of work that you are doing, you must make sure that you, you are with the Lord every hour. Many have the idea that if their life is a working business life, they can do nothing for the salvation of souls, nothing to advance the cause of their redeemer. They say they cannot do things by the halves and therefore turn from religious duties and religious exercises and bury themselves up in where? In the world. They make their business primary and forget God and he is displaced with them. So there are people on this day of atonement when the people are preparing to tell the world that come out of her people, they make their business the primary thing and the Lord's work the secondary thing. And they would rather sacrifice the Lord than sacrifice their regular occupations. And so the earth was filled with the glory of God. Let us go to the book of Hebrews, chapter 8. The book of Hebrews, chapter 8. We are talking about the glory of God filling the whole earth and how we can put ourselves in that position where the Lord, when the angel comes down with the power, he can get a people prepared, sanctified ministry ready for the loud cry. Now in Hebrews chapter 8, we are told, and there are some verses that I'll pick, 
Jesus Christ having obtained a more excellent ministry from verse 6. But by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. For in that first covenant had been for if for if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. For finding fault with them, the people, not the covenant, he said, Behold, the days come, said the Lord, when I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. And so he found a fault with the people. And he is seeking to establish a new covenant with his people this time. And he says in verse 9, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. For this is the covenant that I'll make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I'll do what? I'll put my laws into their mind and write them in where? And so you see the 144 having the father's name in their forehead. He is putting the law. Seal up my laws, seal up my testimonies in my servant's forehead. That is uh, Isaiah chapter 8 verse 16. And this is what the Lord is doing. He wants to seal up his people with his testimonies and with his law. So that they may stand intellectually and spiritually that they cannot be moved by anything. So that even when the system of Babylon brings in her delicacies, the people of God can say no to it because they are standing and they cannot be moved. The question is, for the great day of the Lord has come and we shall be able to stand. It is only those who are sealed with the law of God and with the testimonies in their foreheads and are standing with the lamp at Mount Zion. And so he says in verse 11, and they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least to the greatest. Why? The glory of the Lord shall be upon all the earth. That the people who will be ready to proclaim the message first will be manifesting the message and the whole earth will be covered with the glory of God. Not that we should, we will not have evangelistic campaigns. They will be there to reach out to the people who are still sitting in dark places. But the manifestation of the message shall go forth before the proclamation. That when the people see you, they can be able to recognize that you are a Christian without saying you are a Christian. Think about Peter before even he took anything the people asked him, they said, are you not one of them? Don't you look like Galilea? Because the glory of the Lord was upon his face. And so everyone shall know the Lord from the least to the greatest, because the glory of the Lord shall be shining uh, upon the whole earth. But uh, let us look at Malachi chapter 3. We're just doing uh, an introduction on the message of Revelation 18, 1 to 4. The whole the angel comes down with the power, and we are looking at this power has how it has to fill the hearts of the people. In Malachi chapter three, verse two. Malachi chapter three, verse two. But who may do it? Abide the day of peace. And we shall stand when? Remember, the angel which comes down in Revelation chapter 18, it is to separate the chaff from the wheat and terrible. It is his work, is it? It has to sift everything that doesn't belong to God. But who, who may abide this period? For he is like a refiner's fire and like a fuller soul. And he shall sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver, and he shall purify the sons of Levi and pipe them as gold and silver, that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in what? In righteousness. For we read that in his mind that is written, the Lord our righteousness. And so the people who follow the Lamb of Sheba, he goeth, 
if he is having, the high priest is having the mitre, the Lord our righteousness, what do you expect those people to be having? The same thing, the Lord our righteousness, or holiness unto Jehovah. They shall then offer the offering of Judah in Jerusalem, the pleasant, uh, they then shall the offering of Judah in Jerusalem be pleasant unto the Lord as in the days of the old, as and as in former years. Now, there's a reason why actually Mabaka uses Judah and not Israel. You remember when Israel went into apostasy, and then it was divided into the two uh, tribes or two groups, that is the southern and the northern kingdom, where actually we had Judah and Benjamin uh, being on the southern kingdom, and then the other 10 tribes being the northern kingdom. And the other 10 kingdoms, that is the kingdoms or the tribes that were carried into Babylon. But then we had a remnant in Judah who understood what Israel ought to be doing. And they were the people that represented God. At least that is the group that still held unto the truth. And so when Malachi uses Judah, we have to go back and study how Judah live in time of apostasy. They were the only people that remained with the law of God. While the law was removed from the land and people were in idolatry and they were sodomites and they were doing every kind of uncool thing. And God continued sending them prophets and messengers until there was no remedy. And then Babylon came and raised down the temple and carried them to Babylon. And so we have to start this history of Judah that they were the only remnant of the people at that time. And so when the Lord says that at that time, Judah shall offer an offering uh, in righteousness, then he is speaking about the people in the end time who shall forsake all while the people are in darkness and in apostasy, they shall be counted on to show what Israel ought to do at such a time as this. We are again uh, told that um, the Lord shall come and uh, purify them. He shall sprinkle on them water. In uh, the book of Ezekiel 11, verse 19, talking about, I'll make a new covenant with you in Ezekiel chapter 11, verse 19, as we bring this to a close. Ezekiel chapter 18. 11 verses 17 downwards. Are we there? Amen. Therefore say, thus said the Lord, God, I'll even do what? Gather you from and assemble you out of the countries where you have been done what? You scattered and I'll give you what? Land of Israel. And they shall come thither and they shall take away all the what? Detestable things thereof and all the abomination thereof from them. And I'll do what? I'll give them one heart and I'll put what? A new spirit within you and I'll take the stony hearts out of their flesh and I'll give them a heart of flesh that they may walk in my statutes and keep my ordinances and do them and they shall be my people and I'll be their God. The same thing that is in Hebrews chapter 8. They shall be my people and I shall be their God. And the whole earth shall be covered with the glory of God. Lastly, in uh, last day events, page 179, paragraph 2, LDE 179.2, When you look around the world, you see that uh, everything that has been prophesied in the book of Matthew chapter 24 is happening before our eyes. Is it true or is it false? It's true. And we are just starting to see the nations getting angry, is it? Their intent is toppling each other and to see which one will get into ascendance. But we are told that in the days of these kings, the Lord shall do something. That is another thing to look into. What I want us to go out, the final thought is this. 
the great issue so near at hand that doing what? Enforcement of Sunday laws will weed out those whom God has not appointed and will have what? A pure, true, sanctified ministry prepared for what? For the latter end. The issue is this, we are told that in some instance, it may fall around you and you may not know that it's falling. When the light comes, people will think it is fanatism. People will say all the things they can say because in partaking the spirit of Babylon, they have come accustomed to the things of this world. And they have been blinded in some way, gone from Laodicea to Babylon. And they cannot see things the, things the way God sees them. And so when the light comes down, the people will think that this is fanatism when the Lord will be trying to do something great amongst his people. The question that I have to ask myself, and you have to ask yourself, when this number is made up, when these people are ready to proclaim this message, will you be fit? Will I be fit? Will you allow Christ to purify you, to purify me, so that we may be ready for the work that is ahead of us? We are told it's a great work, but in a little time to do it, and the Lord will cut the work short in righteousness. Now, we only deceive ourselves that we still have time, but the devil knows he has but a short time. And he knew he had a short time 2,000 years ago, but today we still think that we have time. My prayer tonight is that we may understand the shortness of the time. It may not be an emotional thing that will cut a lot. But you will go on your knees. You ask the Lord, show me the time that you are living in. Show me what am I supposed to do at such a time as this. Redify me. Because some of us think that we can redify ourselves for these events. But uh, may the God of all peace prepare all of us to participate in this message of Revelation chapter 18. May the Lord be with us. Shall we kneel for a word of prayer? Our Heavenly Father, before the throne of grace, we kneel. For you have told us that we may come boldly before the throne in time of need that we may obtain mercy. And we see ourselves so deficient of Lord standing in the great times that are coming. Even now we are struggling. But uh, you have promised the weakest of all amongst us, if he hold the hand of the omnipotent, he shall be omnipotent too. And so we thank you because Lord, you are the one who giveth the strength. And in our weakness, the strength is made perfect. I pray that uh, this meeting may be a blessing to your people, that we may not just live here with a theoretical knowledge, but uh, the practical aspect of the message, so that when we get back to our homes, Lord, with the providence that you have given unto us, we may work the works of Christ. And so thank you for gathering us here, Lord, not to condemn us, but to save us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. <laughs>